Today on Inside the Issues, we speak with Jorge Heine on globalization. Welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and a professor of political science at the University of Waterloo. And I'm joined this week by Jorge Heine, the CG Chair of Global Governance and also Distinguished Fellow at the Center for International uh, Governance Innovation here in Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Jorge. Thank you for the opportunity, David. You've recently published a book with uh, your colleague uh, Ramesh Thakur uh, titled The Dark Side of Globalization, okay. which is a good way to begin a conversation about globalization. <laughs> uh, let me ask, first of all, uh, what prompted you to write a book about the dark side of globalization? Yes. Well, this arose out of a conference that was held here at CG. Uh, with uh, an entity called the Globalization Studies Network. And uh, they were keen uh, the, to have their meeting here and discuss with us uh, the topic that they wanted to address. And uh, we suggested to them that globalization and uncivil society, that is what we now call the dark side of globalization, might be a good topic. And that's how uh, it came to be. And globalization is a word that we use every day now. It's entered the English language uh, in full force. But I'm not entirely sure any two people understand it in exactly the same way. So when you talk about globalization in the book, uh, how exactly do you understand that term? Yes. Uh, no, I think it's become a bit of a buzzword, as you quite rightly point out. And what we mean by globalization is basically the tremendous increase in uh, the flow, international flow, of goods, services, ideas, uh, people that we have seen over the past 30 years or so. And you know, people have different views as to why that has come to happen. But our view is that this is very much associated with has been referred, what has been referred to as the third industrial revolution. That is the big change that we have seen in IT and telematics. Uh, basically, if we want to date it, 1980. 1980 is a convenient date, was the year that CNN came into being and that the first uh, PC came on the market. <laughs> so that's a convergence of these two trends. And since then, we have seen this, this tremendous uh, increase in trans-border flows of many things, and uh, that has brought uh, some very good things uh, to the world, uh, but also some that are not so good. Right, and when we think of globalization in the way you've described it, uh, you've described it primarily in terms of the flow of information and also people and capital and goods capital services. And goods, and, and mm -hmm. it, it is true that in the 20th century for the first time these flows began to take place routinely on a global scale. But it's also true, isn't it, that the world's been globalizing for many, many centuries, oh, a very, very course. long time now. Of course, but you know, people say that, you know, and it's true to some degree. But on the other hand, what is important to understand is the, the way how modern technology uh, in, in, for example, telematics, also in IT, but also in transport, the world has shrunk. <laughs> it, it is, you know, very easy to have, you know, you, what, people refer to as sort of simultaneous global events. You, know, you have the Olympic Games, you have the World Soccer Cup, in which you have a billion people watching at the same time. You, know, you did not have those things before. You know? So you really have a different dynamics uh, that is going on that I would argue is in some ways qualitative difference from what you had, say, in the late 19th century, when there was also another big wave of, of globalization. Right, now in the book you do talk about specific aspects of what you call the dark side That's of right. globalization. What, what are the particular well, issues yes. you touch on? You know, what, it seems to me that the, the debate on globalization in many ways has been polarized between those that uh, are what I call the boosters of globalization, that see as sort of the greatest thing since sliced bread or something like that, and uh, the anti-globalization militants. You know, and our position in, in the book is that you know, uh, there is a middle ground, that there are some very good aspects uh, of globalization, but there's also a downside, and we go uh, a bit into that. And basically the thrust of our argument is that globalization, while it has opened up many new opportunities and many uh, new doors for many people around the world, many countries around the world, it has also opened up opportunities for uh, some who want to do mischief. So you have, for example, uh, the drug trade, which is you know one, one illegal drug trade. You have arms trafficking. You have human trafficking. And those are all things that have been, in many ways, facilitated by globalization. 
Uh, so it is important to keep that in mind. And in terms of sort of what does it mean for, say, global governance, which are you know, some of the things we are concerned about, is that there hasn't been a sort of simultaneous increase in the mechanisms of global governance to deal with these flows uh, that would somehow keep pace with that uh, growing uh, flow of, of people, of services, of capital, and so on. So we have this great disconnect. We have the tremendous increase in flows, and we don't have the mechanisms to, you know, I wouldn't say police, but at least monitor what is going on. And as a result of that, uh, you know, many shenanigans can take place. Let's take a couple of those issues as examples. Mm -hmm. uh, drug trade, for mm -hmm. example. So mm -hmm. it's absolutely true that the world has become much smaller and that things and people can move much more quickly. Is it also true, for example, that the flow of drugs has increased mm -hmm. at a concomitant rate? Mm -hmm. Or would it be more accurate to say that, you know, the international flow of drugs today isn't radically different in terms of scale mm -hmm. from the 1960s or the 1970s? Is it as much? bigger a problem today vis-a-vis uh, -vis the 1960s baseline, say, mm -hmm. sure. as the, sp the speed and volume of communications, capital flow, trade? Sure. Yes, well, uh, all the figures I have seen uh, are very much in that direction. I mean, let us look, for example, at uh, the situation of the uh, drug trade in the Americas. Uh, you look at what we're seeing in uh, Mexico today and the sort of real drug wars that are taking place between uh, the government and the various uh, drug lords and drug cartels. I mean, that is a reflection of this tremendous increase in the flow of drugs uh, now directly from Mexico into uh, the United States, which is uh, the big market. Uh, what happens here, of course, is that pressure is applied in certain points. Pressure has been applied, say, in Bolivia. It has been applied in Peru. It has been applied in Colombia. And so the drug trade and the drug cartels move where they see great opportunity. And, you know, they move around. And all the numbers, I mean, one number I've, I've seen in terms of the, the drug trade, the value of the drug trade in the Americas is $60 billion. <laughs> so we're talking a large amount of money. So the answer is yes, uh, there has been an increase. Right. It's a good size uh, economy for some countries, $60 <laughs> billion. Right. We'll be back in just a minute with Jorge Heine to talk about the dark side of globalization. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, or on Twitter. And welcome back, uh, Jorge. Let's talk Thank about you, some of the other mm -hmm. dark issues uh, oh. in globalization. Mm -hmm. um, insurgencies, yes, for example. Right. Yes, you know, they are, again, uh, the term that has been used is glocalization, by which people mean the interaction that you get between this phenomenon of globalization with some very local issues, movements, leaders, people. And it seems to me that in many ways an excellent example of that is uh, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. Uh, they were, you know, according to many observers, perhaps the most globalized uh, terrorist movement in the sense that they were able to deploy the Tamil diaspora abroad, both to get resources and to get uh, political support very effectively. And they run a civil war in Sri Lanka for 26 years, which is you know, a small island, not ideally suited for uh, guerrilla warfare or the type of, of warfare that they were waging. But they managed to do that precisely because they were able to tap into this global network of the Tamil communities abroad, particularly in, in the northern countries in Scandinavia and elsewhere, uh, and uh, were able to hold their own against the Sri Lankan state. Uh, they even had their own air force, quote unquote, and their own navy, modest and small, but still, <laughs> you know. So I think it's, it's a very uh, interesting case. Now, in the end, they were defeated because after 9-11 uh, for the United States and for many other uh, northern powers, it became untenable to have such a movement 
even if at the southern tip of of, of India. Uh, but you know, it was not the sort of thing that could be uh, tolerated. And basically, I would argue that that uh, spelled uh, their end. There's an, there's an interesting and contrasting case uh, to that, uh, which is the Maoist guerrillas in in Nepal, which originally had uh, a significant international network uh, in India and also some connections with, you know, they defined themselves as Maoists with China, but then realized that that was going to be counterproductive <laughs> and decided to become nationalists, cut off their ties, you know, party ties and other political ties with movements abroad and sort of nationalized themselves. And that, in fact, I would argue, was one of the reasons they were able to win, quote unquote. <laughs> you know, they became a political party, elected right. members to parliament, eliminated the monarchy, and are now- They, they won in a sense by no longer being insurgents. They, they well, normalized. That's right, to some degree. And also by cutting off their international ties, which were seen by a number of countries like India, for example, as not acceptable. Right. You know? Now, presumably an insurgency that is sustained mm -hmm by uh, increased ease of flows of capital and, mm -hmm. and arms and so mm -hmm. forth, uh, sustained by globalization. Presumably, the state that is combating that insurgency is also to some degree empowered mm -hmm. by globalization. Mm -hmm. how, how is the state fighting an insurgency empowered by globalization? And, mm -hmm. and does globalization work on balance to the benefit of insurgents or states? The state. Regionists well, or status quo? Sure. Well, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, and here there, there are two things, it seems to me, to keep in mind. One of them is that, on the one hand, the you know, insurgents and terrorist movements, uh, what they fight about as much as anything is for the hearts and minds of public opinion, both at home and abroad. And what will often happen in today's globalized world is that insurgent movements are able to tap international public opinion, and that will often uh, hamper and make more difficult for that particular state to confront that insurgency. It makes it more difficult for them to get weapons and, and makes it more difficult to them to, to fight uh, this particular group. So in, in the other, of course, is the question of being able to um, access the uh, international weapons market and arms market. And again, there are you know, pros and cons. A political pressure is applied in arms producing countries not to sell weapons to that particular state, you know, it can be a problem. Uh, whereas insurgents can often tap the black market, which they often do. <laughs> you know? So contrary to what one might think, uh, the state doesn't have all the advantages in, in such a setting. But since 9-11, wouldn't it be true that globalization has in effect played to the advantage of the United States and its allies fighting Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. for example? because as states, they're the ones who actually have the ability to mm -hmm. shut off financial flows, and monitor communications, uh, sure. ensure that, that people moving across borders are arrested and, and detained and so forth and so sure. on. Well, you know, there's an element of that. But the, the other thing that we found fascinating as we uh, worked on this book is that uh, you also have uh, the situation of a movement like Al-Qaeda. You know, one reason uh, Osama bin Laden has not been found yet, is that uh, he gets all his information not via a satellite phone, which is sort of the favorite mode of communication was in the past of many uh, terrorist leaders or guerrilla leaders, uh, because that is one way they can be very easily tracked down. <laughs> so he gets his information the old fashioned way, via pieces of paper that are passed on by hand to him. <laughs> you know? And that, of course, you know, if you are in Tora Bora or you know, in the uh, mountains, in the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, it's much more difficult uh, to track, no matter you know, uh, how many uh, tools, you take high tech tools you have at your disposal. So again, there's this fascinating interaction between high tech on the one hand and sort of even medieval ways of communicating. Right. And if you get the mix right, uh, you can be in business for a long time. Yes, yes. as we know. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment with Jorge Heine talking about globalization. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, 
and on Twitter. Uh, welcome back, Jorge. Let's Thanks. talk a bit about the bright side of globalization. Um, very few things are either all good or all bad. So what, in your view, are some of the positive aspects of globalization? Well, look, uh, the, the way we see it and what we develop in the book is the argument there is very much a bright side to globalization. And the, these increased uh, flows of, of goods, of services, of people have brought tremendous opportunity to many countries. Um, you know, if we look at what has happened, for example, to poverty. Uh, let us just take two countries, uh, which happen to be the two biggest countries in the world. One of them is China, and the other of them is India. In the course of these past you know, 25, 30 years, which is the period that we're talking about, there has been a, a tremendous decrease in the number of people that are under the poverty line in these two countries. So right there, off the bat, <laughs> you, know, you have a, a, a very positive outcome of globalization. And these are two countries you know, that they have had the highest growth rates in the world in the past uh, few years, in you know, China for even longer time. Um, and, but it, this is not just confined to, to the two Asian giants, as they are called, but there are also a number of, of, of other countries that have done extremely well. Singapore is one to mention, you know, is, is what is a city-state for practical purposes. Uh, Chile is another country in Latin America that often people mention as a country that has made the most of, of globalization. Right, and you, you served as a Chilean ambassador for many years. That's right. That's and right. Chile had a very conscious strategy, didn't it, of trying to that's leverage right. globalization that's for right. the benefit of the country. That's right, and, and that's, that's what I find interesting because if you get the mix right, you know, it is not a question of simply lowering your tariffs and opening yourself up to eliminate all capital controls and you know lower your tax rate and things that that way you know all sort of good things will happen that is not the case it's, it's fascinating we have had a sort of real life experiment on this which is ireland <laughs> you know ireland was touted for a long time as the example that everybody else should follow and in fact we all know what happened in ireland you know, iceland is in some ways even a more extreme example of that so the way we see it countries like say singapore or chile uh, also small countries with their own challenges, but they've managed to get the mix right. You know, you need some measure of, say, capital controls when you are in a financial bubble. Uh, and at the same time, have to know when to open up. You, know, you need to be uh, conscious that export promotion is an important part of, of what you do. Chile's market is a small market. We're talking about 17 million people. So you need to go out and, and reach out into the world. Chile's exports grew from $9 billion in 1990 to around $70 billion in 2008. And in so, the Chilean case, was, mm -hmm. was political democratization an essential part of the strategy of taking advantage of globalization? Well, or was that I, an independent I, no, well, I process? would say the following. The opening up, to be fair, the opening up of the Chilean economy in terms of lowering tariffs and so on really took place under the military regime. But the growth rate really started to Chile's average growth rate over the past 20 years has been around 5%. Under the military regime, it was 2.5%. So mm -hmm. the, the growth really started to uh, explode, as it were, uh, in, in the 90s uh, with, with, with democracy. And there, there was a very self-conscious strategy, it's interesting that you should ask, uh, which was, how do we go about in this next phase? We have lowered tariffs, the economy has opened up, but how do we go about conquering these various markets? You know, and some people say, you don't need to do anything. You just keep lowering tariffs and things will happen by themselves. Well, the world doesn't work that way, <laughs> you know. If you open your own markets to everybody else, they will just take advantage of you and they won't give you anything in return. So what Chile did was what I called a lateral uh, strategy of uh, international trade, which is signing FTAs with individual countries. Chile has signed 58 such Including FTAs, Canada? Including Canada, which was the first North-South uh, FTA had a sign in 1996. So, uh, and that has worked quite well. You know, a lot of economists, including my good friend Jagdish Bhagwati, are very critical of FTAs. They say this leads to a spaghetti bowl of agreements that are right. very difficult to monitor. But in fact, I would argue that, you know, in specific cases, they can work very well. The reason I ask about the political democratization is that some people think that one of the key advantages of globalization is that it will spread democracy and mm -hmm. liberal norms will become normal mm -hmm. <laughs> as opposed to unusual. Sure. And yet China seems to be an example of a country that is defying that logic and has liberalized economically but so far succeeded in avoiding 
meaningful political democratization. That's what, right. what have we got wrong there? Do, is it that we don't understand globalization or that we don't understand <laughs> China? Or are, do we just need to be more patient? Well, you know, there, it's, it's a good question. You know, uh, and, you know, forget China. Uh, look at Singapore. Uh, you know, uh, Singapore uh, has been called by some as a trustee form of democracy, you know. And it hasn't, you know, changed very much despite all the tremendous progress that has taken place. So I would say the relationship between globalization on the one hand and democratization on the other is a lot more complex than we might, uh, than we might think. And uh, I, we need to look a lot more into it. It's not a mechanical one-to-one <laughs> -one relationship, you know. You do have, you know, the state, you do have political agents that have their own agendas. And they will look and work with globalization in, in different ways. And, but it does seem to be true that the countries that are least well plugged into the global mm -hmm. economy are also those that seem to be faring the, the least well on most of the measures of well-being. No, no, of course, no doubt. Uh, I mean, on the question of, of development and economic growth, what we find is that those countries that manage to get their insertion into the global economy right will do well. Those that don't and that for some reason are unable to do so or that develop some sort of say autarkic programs, say Myanmar or North Korea, well, we all know where that leads to, you right. know. Uh, and even if you don't have such a sort of self-conscious design, even if you just mismanage things like countries in Central in, in Western Africa, uh, the result can also be disastrous. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, we'll be back in just a minute one more time with Jorge Heine. You're listening to or watching Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Uh, welcome back, Jorge. Let's turn now, finally, belatedly, to the, the global governance dimension. And uh, as you've said, globalization is a a massive force in the world, and it's something that is not particularly thought out, uh, not obviously easily controlled or regulated or managed, and yet we, we must try somehow to manage globalization so that it benefits as many as possible and harms as few as mm -hmm. possible. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the, the global governance challenge to globalization? What are we doing well? What are we doing particularly badly? Well, I think uh, you know, a lot of uh, progress has been made. Uh, we, we have um, entities, uh, for example, like uh, the IMF. It used to be the IMF was very much against capital controls. You may remember during the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s, uh, they were adamant that countries shouldn't impose capital controls. Uh, well, some did, like Malaysia, uh, and managed to get out of the crisis quite well. So now, finally, uh, the IMF has come around to the notion that under certain circumstances, capital controls are the right thing to do. <laughs> so it seems to me progress is being made in the sense that you know, globalization, I compare it to a huge ocean wave. You know? If you lower all the barriers to that, they sweep you away. You know? Now, if you leave some and you're able to manage it, you can get all the benefits that, that come from that. So I think entities like the IMF that is coming around now to you know what I always thought was the right approach, uh, like the G20 uh, that are trying to monitor uh, what is going on and establish some guidelines, are, are making some progress. I'm, I must say I'm particularly concerned about uh, the financial, international financial flows uh, in, in a lot of, uh, countries, particularly in the developing world, but also elsewhere, what you have is uh, these capitals that come at one moment and leave the next. And by the time they leave, they leave behind the great wreckage. <laughs> you know? right. no, so you need some ways of dealing with that and avoiding this, because these countries, it's through no fault of their own. <laughs> you know? They're able to attract international uh, funds, which you know should be a good thing, and then suddenly they are left in the lurch when this capital leaves. <laughs> you know, so you need mechanisms to be able to, you know, avoid uh, the worst kind of effects of 
uh, of those flows. And let me give you another example. That, and I remember the, uh, the British government uh, a few years ago, I don't know now, but a few years ago was particularly concerned about this. Uh, and this, we have a, a chapter in the book on this as well, the international flow of small arms. You know. Here we are talking about you know, nuclear weapons and all that entails, and non-proliferation, which of course is very important. But you know, if you look at the number of people that are killed around the world uh, through uh, small arms, it's a very large number. And if we could get some way of controlling that a bit more, I'm not saying you know, taking them away or banning them, I'm looking for ways in which uh, the flow of these arms can be controlled. I mean, to give you an example, what is happening today in, in Central America, you have countries like Honduras, like El Salvador, where the murder rate per 100,000, we're talking about 40 to 50 victims uh, a year, you know, which is the highest in the world. You know, one reason is because of the tremendous inflow of small arms into these countries. Some of these countries had civil wars in the 1980s. And the murder rate today is higher than it was you know, during those civil wars, which gives you an indication of the challenge this entails. No, that is amazing. But to the extent that you're going to govern globalization globally, we are still stuck with, maybe benefiting from, but at least we, we have to use the existing uh, Westphalian system of sovereign states. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to persuade states mm -hmm. to implement certain measures. Of course. Uh, now, to some extent, uh, that's not difficult if the nature of the problem is simple coordination. Mm -hmm. So you could say uh, global governance on communications is relatively easy because you have to have common standards or no one can communicate, sure. and so forth and so on. But, but things like capital controls, right? Sometimes states are very jealous of their autonomy in decision making over things like mm -hmm. capital controls or currency rates mm -hmm. or greenhouse gas emissions and this, this sort of thing. How do, we, sure. how do we cultivate a climate of cooperation mm -hmm. when some of these issues are inherently competitive or will involve trade-offs between yeah. countries? It's very tough. You know, obviously, we, we don't have a global government. So, how do you produce global governance? Well, one mechanism, one mechanism that has been um, been put on the table. You know, we've seen this in in Africa, and uh, also a bit in the G20, is peer review, you know, which is a way of. I mean, there's no central authority telling governments what to do, but what you have is committees <laughs> that will get together and say, okay, this is happening in this country, this is happening in this other country this is working well, this isn't working well. And so on that basis, on sort of goodwill basis, largely voluntary, but you know, peer pressure works. <laughs> you know, you, you know, may be able to get some results. So you know, realistically, I would think that is perhaps uh, the best we can hope for on many issues uh, at this point. And now one of your next book projects uh -huh. is called The Handbook of Modern Diplomacy, right. and you yourself are a retired diplomat. That's right. Uh, I remember in the 80s there was a great deal of talk about how globalization would, would render diplomacy obsolete. That's right. So uh, some what's people, your view on well, this? Well, some people still say that, <laughs> and they say that because of email and because of summits, uh, diploma, diplomats as sort of the intermediaries are uh, no longer needed. Well, to my mind, you know, that is a bit like saying that because we have the internet and we have television, uh, we do not need books or newspapers. In fact, it, the opposite is true. You need more of them because there's so much going on. The, the amount of capital that moves around, the number of people that move around, the services that are exported are uh, every day increase, that you need somebody to be a hinge, you know, to actually do something to monitor, if not management would be it's too ambitious a word, but at least to monitor what is going on. If you don't have that, uh, well, the, the negative consequences can be very high. Well, a very important topic and uh, a very important book, and I, right. I hope it attracts the attention it deserves. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been joined today by Jorge Heine, the CG Chair of uh, Global Governance at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and Distinguished Fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Please join us again next week for uh, another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast, and look for us at cgonline.org 
on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Today on Inside the Issues, we speak with Jorge Heine on globalization. Welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and a professor of political science at the University of Waterloo. And I'm joined this week by Jorge Heine, the Good CG Chair. Yeah, people have different views as to why that has come to happen. But our view is that this is very much associated with has been referred, what has been referred to as the third industrial revolution. That is, the big changes that we have seen in IT and telematics. Uh, basically, if we want to date it, 1980. 1980 is a convenient date, was the year that CNN came into being, and that the first uh, PC came on the market. <laughs> so that's a convergence of these two trends. And since then, we have seen this, this tremendous uh, increase in transborder flows of many things, and uh, that has brought uh, some very good things uh, to the world, uh, but also some that are not so good. Right, and when we think of the era of global governance, and also distinguished fellow at the Center for International uh, Governance Innovation here in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Jorge. Thank you for the opportunity, David. You've recently published a book with uh, your colleague uh, Ramesh Thakur uh, titled The Dark Side of Globalization, which is a good way to begin a conversation about globalization. <laughs> uh, let me ask, first of all, uh, what prompted you to write a book about the dark side of globalization? Yes. Well, this arose out of a conference that was held here at CG uh, with uh, an entity called the Globalization Studies Network. And uh, they were keen uh, that to have their meeting here and discuss with us uh, the topic that they wanted to address. And uh, we suggested to them that globalization and uncivil society, that is what we now call the dark side of globalization, might be a good topic. And that's how uh, it came to be. And globalization is a word that we use every day now. It's entered the English language uh, in full force. Mm -hmm. But I'm not entirely sure any two people understand it in exactly the same way. So when you talk about globalization in the book, uh, how exactly do you understand that term? Yes. Uh, no, I think it's become a bit of a buzzword, as you quite rightly point out. And what we mean by globalization is basically the tremendous increase in uh, the flow, international flow, of goods, services, ideas, uh, people that we have seen over the past 30 years or so. Globalization, in the way you've described it, uh, you described it primarily in terms of the flow of information and also people and capital and goods capital services and goods and and mm -hmm. it, it is true that in the 20th century for the first time these flows began to take place routinely on a global scale but it's also true isn't it that the world's been globalizing for many many centuries oh, a very very course. long time now of course but you know people say that you know and it's true to some degree but on the other hand what is important to understand is the the way how modern technology uh, in in, for example, telematics, also in IT, but also in transport. The world has shrunk. I mean, it is you know, very easy to have 